In this uh, section, we will start discussing simple harmonic motion. or oscillation. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, let's imagine I have a spring system sitting on some frictionless surface. This thing at equilibrium is at x is equal to zero. And this gives us a mass m, say, all right? Now, the Hooke's Law spring, if you recall, is minus kx, right? And if this is equal to the net force, that is also equal to ma, right? So what we have is that we have ma is equal to, is equal to minus kx, right? Or another way of writing this is that this is m times d squared x dt squared, is equal to minus kx, right? Okay. Or which is another way of writing, if you bring m to one side, d squared x dt squared is equal to minus k over m times x, right? Now, we want to solve for x. x is now a function of t. And we want to solve for it. Okay. So in order to do so, we have to do the classic thing. We have to rule guess and check. Okay. So you have to come up with the appropriate guess. So let's basically do this guess. We're going to guess x of t is equal to a cosine omega t. Okay, so these are just two constants here. Okay, and I'm just gonna try to figure out what these constants have to be, All right? So, toward that end, that's basically right. So we're just gonna guess, so we're gonna plug this in, All right? And the thing to note is that um, when I write d squared x dt squared this is d squared dt squared of a cosine omega t so this is taking two factors of d by dt so we take it one at a time so it's basically d by dt of d by dt of a cosine omega t when d by t hits this thing you get a sine minus sine and then uh, the, by the chain rule, you always pull out one factor omega. So the first thing you get is d by dt, that's this part right here, minus omega a sine omega t, okay? All right, now, you can hit this again, all right? This would just pit, makes, if you take a derivative with respect to sine, this would become cosine, but you pull another factor omega again. So we minus omega squared a cosine omega t, okay? So that's crucial, that's a crucial thing to know, right? Um, you can also guess b sine omega t, right? And in this case, if you do the same exercise, all right? Um, this is d squared dt squared of b sine omega t. So hit it once, you get a cosine with one factor of omega. Hit it again, you get a minus sine sine with another factor of omega, so it becomes minus omega squared b sine omega t. Okay? So they both have similar aspects. Basically, this thing in here is the same as that. Okay? And you just get this minus omega squared there as well, right? Okay, so if we just take our guess initially, right? Let's plug that in. So basically, d squared x, d 
dt squared is equal to minus kx. So, so this piece right here, look at your m, this piece right here, we just determined it's minus omega squared a cosine omega t. So that's just this piece right there. Okay, is equal to uh, this piece right there, minus k over m. And what is this piece? This is x, which was my guess right there, a cosine omega t. Now, if you stare at this thing, what you will notice is that this a cosine omega t appears on both sides. So we can cancel that out if you like. And we finally get the condition, omega squared is equal to k over m. So that means my guess works if omega is equal to square root of k over m, right? And then this guess will work just perfectly fine. Right? Okay, now, you, if you had guessed this, you would have gotten the same result. You would have gotten this as well. And so the general solution is actually the sum of these two, right? So let's write that down. Same is true. for guess B sine omega t is equal to x t, okay? So the general solution is x of t is equal to A cosine omega t plus B sine omega t, right? Okay, where and omega is equal to square root of k over m, okay? So you can combine this together equal to, I'll call this as, um, I'll call this as uh, a cosine omega t plus delta, all right? So basically, rather than two constants, A and B, you combine the one constant. This is, uh, this is the amplitude. It's some constant. And this is here is called the phase. Right? Okay. And this defines basically the position of mass as a function of t, right? Okay, so what is that function? So what that thing does is basically it looks like a cosine, right? And so we can plot this thing out. t here, let's put x of t there, right? We'll put delta is equal to zero for now. Just make it simple. And this is cosine wave, so it looks like that. Okay. And how far does it get? Well, basically, this is A minus A. Okay. And at this point, this is going to be pi over omega, because omega times, times t. Uh, omega times pi over omega is just cosine pi, right? And this was this full one full wave. I think this is basically two pi over omega, right? Okay, so this is one period here. One period. And so what that implies is that t, which is the period, is equal to two pi over and the frequency, f, which is the frequency, the omega is the angular frequency, this is the regular frequency, so it's equal to 1 over t, that's just omega over 2 pi. Okay, so, we can uh, do an example here, right, so suppose, so, so what that means is that at t equals zero, x is zero is equal to a cosine of delta, just plugging in for t equals zero here. 
and then v of 0 is dx dt, which is minus omega a sine omega t plus delta. Let's evaluate t equals 0, evaluate it at t equals 0, that's just minus omega a sine of delta. Okay? All right, so let's take an example here. Okay, so suppose t is equal to one second, that's period, right? And initial v is equal to one meter per second, x is equal to one meter, okay? Find a and delta, all right? So we have to find that. Let's go ahead and do this. So omega is equal to 2 pi over t. So that means omega is equal to, well, let's see, 2 pi over t, that's just 2 pi now. Okay. Radians per second. Okay. So v is equal to omega minus omega a sine of delta. And that we determined is equal to 1. T of v is 0. And x is 0 is equal to a cosine delta, which basically x is equal to also equal to 1. All right? Okay. So, this part right here, that's 2 pi minus 2 pi, a sine delta. All right? And so, we can go ahead and figure what delta is. So, we can divide this two, we get a tangent out, that cancels the a. So, what this gives me is that um, if I divide out minus 2 pi, um, I should write out a sine delta over a cosine delta, right? This is a to cancel, this is minus 2 pi times the tangent of delta. It's equal to basically these two things, 1 over 1. Tangent delta is equal to minus 1 over 2 pi, right? And if you just figure this out, this turns out to be minus 0 0.158 radians, right? Which if you now plug it into basically here, you will get that A is equal to 1.01, .01, right? So the amplitude is that, and that's basically the phase there. And that's how you can figure that out, right? So in other words, you could write x of t is equal to 1.01, that's a, cosine, 2 pi, that's omega, times t, minus, or which is plus delta, which is minus, 1 over 2 pi. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, minus um, 0 0.158 radians. Okay. All right, so that is the uh, first part of it. Now let's try another example here. Here's the second example. Okay, suppose you stretch A spring with a spring constant k, which is equal to what I choose. I chose, let's see, one newton per meter, right? For x equals one meter, okay? And mass equals 10 kg per kilogram. All right, so let's draw a picture of this thing. So this is my spring. There's my mass, m. This is 10 kilograms. This is basically sitting on some surface here, for instance. All right. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to find. Oh, let's go find omega x of t v of t and v max, 
All right. Relatively straightforward. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay, first thing, omega is equal to square root of k over m. That's easy enough to find. That was 1 over the mass was 10. Square root of that. That's going to be equal to 0 0.316. All right. Uh, radians per second, if you want to add your units. All right, so that means that x of t is equal to um, a cosine omega t, right? So that basically is a cosine 0 0.316 times t. I know that x equals 0, that's 1 meter. So I plug that in, that's basically a cosine of 0, which is 1. A equals 1. All right, so that's pretty simple. So plug that back in, that's basically going to be cosine 0 0.316 times t. That's basically x of t. Okay. And now when I find basically v of t, that's just dx dt minus omega a sine omega t. Let's plug everything. A was 1 minus 0 0.316. Three one six sine zero point three one six times t right, and so I could get basically the max now. That's just basically the amplitude of this thing. That's going to be equal to zero point three one six meters per second. Okay, that's relatively straightforward there. All right, so now. Let's take a look at the energy. Now, the potential energy in the case of a spring is just one half kx squared, right? Kinetic energy you know already, that's just like one half mv squared, okay? Now, fortunately, we do know what basically x and v are, so let's write that down x of t is equal to a cosine of omega t plus delta oh, v is equal to dx dt equals minus omega a sine omega t okay plus delta all right so let's work out what the energy is Kinetic energy in this case is the, the energy is equal to kinetic energy plus the potential energy. Right? Okay? So this can be equal to 1 half mv squared plus 1 half kx squared. Guess what? I have both these things here, so it's equal to 1 half m. V is omega squared. The minus sign will, will be killed off by the fact that it's squared. A squared sine squared omega t plus delta. Okay, first part. That's kinetic energy plus now the potential energy. What's the potential energy? That's just one half k times x squared. That's a squared cosine squared omega t plus delta. Okay. Now the key is that you gotta recall omega is equal to square root of k over m. So you plug this in, this basically becomes omega squared, it's k over m, the m's will cancel, and you basically have a k a squared on both sides. Right? Let's go ahead and work that out. You plug that in, it's one half k squared a squared, okay? And now it's just the difference between these two terms is the sine and cosine. So it's sine squared omega t plus delta plus cosine squared omega t plus delta, and lo and behold, this because it reduces another one. So this is equal to one half k squared a squared, which sorry, just that's just k a squared, which is a constant. Okay? And so because energy is a constant, that means energy is basically conserved in this case. So energy is conserved. Which makes it very useful for all kinds of problems. Okay, so that's basically one. That's not terribly exciting, all right? So now let's look at the average 
potential average kinetic energy. Okay. So let's look at the average. And the way I say no average is Ke over a bar. This is mean average. Okay. So if I plot the kinetic energy per se, which is one half m v squared, this is one half k a squared sine squared omega t plus delta. Okay, uh, you just for a second just assume that um, the uh, delta is zero, all right? Okay, it doesn't change anything, per se. So, this is time, energy, and so it starts out like this, reaches a peak, comes back down again, and then reaches another peak and comes back down again, okay? Okay, and so, this is at pi, over to omega, and this is 3 pi over to omega, right? This is the uh, kinetic energy. The potential energy we worked out was 1 half k a squared cosine squared omega t plus delta. Okay, let's basically assume delta for instance for now is just zero. It doesn't really change any results here. This is t, this is potential energy, you get to look like this. Same thing again. This is, um, hold on, sorry. Um, this one is pi over 2 omega. That's just pi over omega. This is pi over 3 half pi over omega in that case. Right. Okay, so first things first, all right? Um, These things are basically the same thing, all right? They're just sine squared, cosine squared. So you can imagine that the potential energy is equal to the kinetic energy at one average, all right? The average of it, okay? And so what that means is that the energy is equal to the average kinetic energy to the average potential energy. But because they're the same, what you end up getting is you end up getting basically say two times potential energy average is equal to the energy of the system. Right, so we can expect the potential energy on average will be half the energy available, okay? And similar for kinetic energy average, right? Okay. But what I want to do, however, is I want to basically show this more mathematically. And so I'm going to have to really take the average, right? So what's the average? So, so we have basically t different data points T1, T2, T3, dot, 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 okay? Then the average potential energy, okay, is equal to 1 over N, where N is the number of points here. Sum on I equals 1 to N of the potential energy at different times, okay? So similarly, the average kinetic energy it's just going to be 1 over n again, sum on i equals 1 to n, the kinetic energy as a function of time i as well. Okay. Right. So, in the limit, where n goes to infinity, then basically these sums just become Integrals here. So what you have is that basically kinetic energy on average is one over t integral from zero to t one over one period of the potential energy dt, and you have the kinetic energy is just simply equal to that as well one over t integral from zero to t the kinetic energy dt. Okay. Now 
we only have just basically do this for one case, and there's other case that pop out, right? So we're basically doing this integral here. Let's write that down, one over t, okay? And where's my potential? There it is, right there. It's gonna be integral zero to t, one half k a squared, cosine squared omega t plus delta, okay? And so now I have to basically do this particular um, integral here, right? Okay, so let's go take a look at this thing, all right? Um, and you can assume delta equals zero for now, but, but like it's going to have to be, okay? So this is basically, we have to note that this thing is a cosine squared, and so we note cosine squared of theta is equal to one half minus one half cosine two theta, right? And so what you have is a potential energy on average, integral zero to t of one half k a squared, one half minus one half cosine. Now theta is going to be the play the role of a uh, Oh, 2 omega t plus 2 delta, okay? All right? Well, it would turn out that when you do this integral here, well, this is dt. When you do this integral here, this is, sorry, 2 theta. This integral will integrate to 0. But this integral we can do, right? This is basically that from 0 to t. So it's going to be equal to 1 over t one half k a squared, one half times t minus zero, which is zero, right? So this cancels that, one quarter k a squared, right? Which is exactly one half of the energy available to us. All right. Let's keep going. All right, so let's go take a look at a uh, object on a vertical spring. Okay, so here's how it works. All right, so imagine that you have initially a spring in its equilibrium position. Okay, and now you let it go, so gravity works on this thing, okay, sorry, it's a circle, and it basically, it's basically goes down by a factor h, say, for instance, all right, okay, and I want to find the, I want to find the period t, okay? All right, so how do I go about doing this? Right. Well, I know what t is, actually. That's actually pretty simple. That's 2 pi over omega. And omega is basically square root of k over m. Right? And, but the problem is that I neither know what k is nor m. Right? So that's a problem. Okay? So how do I figure this out? Well, I, at this point, this is an equilibrium. And so if you draw a force diagram there, you get a factor mg and you get a factor of the spring force, which is going to be minus kh, right? So now you, all of a sudden you have basically k over m, right? That's k and m related to each other, and you have basically um, uh, uh, h here as well, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and figure this out, right? So the, the force sum of the f net in the y direction equals zero because we're assuming this thing's not moving for a second. So it's gonna be equal to, see, so there's a spring force here. That's, uh, my, um, sorry, that's plus kh, okay? I'm gonna basically choose y to be this direction. And so this force is in the same direction as that. Good. And then minus mg. And so what this implies is that, K, which is one of the variables that you do not know, 
much better yet, k over m, right, is equal to g over h. Okay? And so that implies is that omega, which is the square root of k over m, guess what? Is now also the square root of g over h. And so I want to find t. 2 pi over omega is equal to 2 pi square root of h over g. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we've been doing spring systems thus far, but that's not the only system out there. The next system we should study is the simple pendulum. So let's go and look at that. Cool. Okay. So let's imagine I have a pendulum that's swinging some angle. They just say here, right? This has some mass m. This is some length l. It has some tension force t moving in some direction. And it's going to be moving along an arc. Okay, so let's say this is S. And instantaneously, I'm going to draw basically what X is now. And I'm going to draw what Y is, right? So Y is, par is parallel to the tension force in that case, right? And so I know that it's not moving along Y. Some of the forces in the Y direction is equal to zero, which is equal to... Let's take a look at this thing. This field of force, mg. Okay, so you can see basically this the angle here is also theta as well. So it's going to go to um, mg cos theta plus the minus sign because you're going in the opposite direction. T. Alright? Okay? That's one. Alright, so you can get the tension from that. Okay, so that's not too bad. Now the second case I want to basically look at is what the forces, some of the forces in the y direction are, in the x direction. So some of the forces in the x direction, well there's just this one force basically, and that's just this piece of the gravitational potential. So minus Fg of x, which is minus mg sine of theta. Okay. So, if this is f net x, then I have basically d squared x dt squared times m is equal to what's all the forces? There? Just one. mg sine theta times x. Alright? So let's just simplify this a little bit and get I'm getting that d squared x dt squared is equal to minus uh, cos h minus h g sine theta. All right. Now, <laughs> this thing does not look like some of my oscillate. Why? Because in that case, basically, what I have is that there's a I have an x here and I have a theta. There's not even the right variables for crying out loud, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to convert the x's to thetas, right? So to do that, I notice that this is basically here. This is d theta. And so x is going to be equal to dx is going to be ds, which is some arc length along that path. It's just basically l times d theta, okay? So when I plug this thing in, I get l d theta squared dt squared is equal to minus <coughs> the hell is that thing? Oops. Minus g sine theta. Okay? And so I will divide by L on both sides. Get d squared theta. Dt squared is equal to minus g over L. 
Fine. Okay. So this just manipulates things a little bit. Sorry. All right. This just manipulates things a little bit. So now the key is that for small theta, I can approximate sine theta is equal to theta. All right. So when I do that, I get the following: d d d squared because of minus g over l. Everything else is the same. Except that now sine theta is replaced with theta. And so now this looks like the simple harmonic oscillator equation, right? So the exact mapping now between this equation here right, and this equation here. So for instance, there's a constant here that gets mapped to that constant there. There's a variable x that basically becomes the variable g over l. I mean, the variable theta here in this case, right? Okay, so you can go ahead and solve this as before. And the answer is that theta as a function t is equal to a cosine of omega t plus delta, right? The same guess that we had before, but now we know what omega is equal to. Omega is equal to that funny constant on the front, which is square root of g over l now, okay? Uh, g over capital L, right? And then a is the where a has to be basically, right? Um, we actually don't know the information at this point to basically specify what a has to be, right? But we assume for now that it's basically just something that's there that's um, non-zero. Uh, non Okay, so that was very nice, all right? Okay, we learned something about simple harmonic oscillators. We learned how to solve them. So now let's move on to a slightly more complicated topic. Let's talk about damped simple harmonic oscillators. That's SHO, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna introduce, introduce a damping force. F of D is equal to minus K, oh, uh, sorry minus b times d, okay? So this is a little bit different, right? It always opposes the velocity, right? So you can imagine it might be like a spring moving some mass here, and but seeing some water bath here, for instance, right? Okay. So in this case, the forces are going to be equal to net forces. It's equal to, well, let's see, there's the spring part minus kx, and there's a velocity part minus bv. That's a damping force, right? It be minus kx, minus bv, b, dx, dt. Okay? And so, if this is equal to the mass times acceleration, which is the mass times d squared x, dt squared, now you have something that depends on x with, some other, with, some, with, its own, with itself as its derivative, right? So let's write this down a single equation now, d squared x, dt squared plus b over m dx dt plus k over m times x equals zero. All right, so this is d di dt to the one. This you can imagine is d to the d by dt to the zero, okay? Okay, so I have this equation here. I want to be able to solve it, okay? So how do I solve it? So I'm gonna basically have a guess here. And it's gonna be a very special guess. I'm gonna guess this is script A, e to the sigma t, okay? Where these constants are complex. Okay. All right, so that's my guess. I gotta just plug it in now. So let's go plug that in. So that means this is uh, x of t. So d squared dt squared plus b over m d by dt plus k over m. I have that operate on script a e to the sigma t. I'm going to get basically the following. So the a's won't really matter, right? There's some constants here, right? But what will matter is what the sigma. Right, so 
when I hit through with this thing, just pulls out, uh, every time I hit with DYT, I pull one package of sigma. That's all I do. So I get sigma squared, that's this part, plus B over M times sigma, that's the second part. My last part is plus K over M is equal to zero. All right. And so I know how to solve this. This is solved using the quadratic formula, where this is A, B, and C. So what you end up getting is you end up getting um, sigma is equal to minus B, so minus B over M plus or minus the square root of B squared over M squared minus 4 AC. So that's 1 times C, that's K over M. Divided by 2a, that's just 2 things. Okay. okay. Alright, so everything looks fine except for this thing in here, right? So there are three possibilities. The first case is that um, b squared over m squared minus 4k over m is bigger than 0. Okay, so that's the first case, right? And so what happens in this case basically is that sigma is equal to, well there's two possibilities, minus b over 2m plus or minus square root of, now this is positive, so that means that like, uh, that's whatever the hell that is, right? That's b squared over 4m squared minus k over m, right? And so in that case, basically, there are two solutions, right? One of the plus and minus. So one of them drops out very steeply, okay? And the other one is basically minus b plus this thing, which is some positive value, though smaller because of this, than b over 2m. So that's the other thing. Okay? So this is basically, you can think of this sigma plus, sigma minus there. Okay? All right. Uh, actually, it's e to the sigma t, e to the minus sigma t. All right? Okay. So this is the first case which we call the overdamped case. Okay. Now let's move on to the second case. Second case is basically if b squared over m squared minus 4k over m is equal to zero. That applies to sigma is equal to minus b over 2m, right? Okay. From uh, this thing here, right? And so this is called the critically damped damped case. Alright? Okay. Now one final one, which we should discuss. b squared over m squared minus 4k over m Ooh, oh, really squeaky. it's less than zero okay so in that case sigma is equal to well if you look at what sigma is it was always this thing right here, right? And so if this thing's less than zero, that means if I flip this thing, I'll get something positive here, but I'm gonna pull a minus one. That just gives me an I, right? So it'd be basically minus B over two M, right? Plus or minus I, now don't forget I now. And I'm gonna reverse the signs. This is gonna be K over M minus 
b squared over m squared times basically 4 in that case. Okay? And this is called the underdamp case. Okay, so you might notice one thing. Basically, this is a real part. This is imaginary. Okay. All right. And so, if we write this thing all out, equal to minus b over qm plus or minus i square root of k over m minus b squared over 4m m m so or, or for m uh, squared sorry m squared all right okay um, Okay, and so this piece right here has an imaginary part. I will call that omega prime, right? And omega prime, see this thing here, I'll call omega zero equals k over m. That's what it would be, that. This equals, I'm going to pull a factor of omega zero here. And then this, this leaves me with one minus. Um, B, I'm going to basically divide it by B squared, 4, M squared, omega 0 squared there. Okay, all right. And you can guess that this number is typically small or not, right? And so in this case, basically X as a function of T is equal to E this sigma t, which is e to the minus b over 2m times t, e to the uh, i omega 0 times t times this square root 1 minus b squared over 4m squared omega 0 squared, right? And so it's defined omega prime is equal to omega 0 times s squared root 1 minus b squared over 4m squared omega 0 squared. And so if you plug that in, this becomes uh, cosine omega t, right? So it's going to be equal to e to the minus b over 2m times t cosine of omega prime times t plus delta, or how delta is going to be, right? Okay, now one thing uh, I want to point out is that, let's look at this term right here, okay? Let's compute the energy in this case, energy was a function of time, okay? So, if you look at this thing, right, this is just going to be one half k a squared, right? But A now encompasses this thing as well. So it's going to be equal to 1 half K, wherever A squared is, E to the minus B over M times T, right? Why is it B over M, not B over 2M? Because this thing's squared out, right? So that's what you get, right? And so now, let's look at this thing. This is time times some factor. This must be a 1 over time. So we define tau is equal to m over b, and so this becomes minus 1 half k a squared e to the minus t over tau, okay? And so this thing here is going to cause it to decay in time, and so this is called decay time constant here, okay? Beautiful, okay? And basically, this is the time it takes for energy to decrease 
by e to the minus 1. Right. OK, beautiful. Now, the other thing is that omega prime is going to be usually very close to omega. All right, so we're going to make that assumption. All right. So let me define. Q is equal to omega zero times tau, right? And basically, this is the essentially it's the number of oscillations per one e for time the energy, okay? Okay, and this is called the quality factor, right? And it's typically very large, right? Okay, all right. And so, um, if we look at, we ask the question, for instance, right? How much energy do you lose per one period? Energy. period, we could go ahead and answer that question here, right? So, dE, e as a function of t, is equal to e0, e to the minus t divided by tau. All right, that's just something we just sort of figured out, right? And so, we can write... dE dt is equal to minus 1 over tau e0 e to the minus t over tau because that's not, this is just e minus 1 over tau times e all right okay and so what that implies is that basically if I want to find out what delta e is over e delta e is just going to be dE dt, roughly speaking, times delta t over e. And I can pick delta t to be one period, so it's basically dE dt times t over e. Plug everything in now, so it basically becomes minus 1 over tau times e. And this one is just going to be 2 pi over omega 0. And so, what I end up getting is that this is equal to minus 2 pi over omega 0 times tau. And guess what? We just define what omega 0 times tau is. That's just q. Minus 2 pi over q. Right? And so that's basically where q is very useful, basically over one period. We lose 2 pi over q in energy. Okay? And so q is typically very large, and so basically you have a very large number in the bottom here. That means the amount of energy you lose per period is actually pretty small. Okay? Okay. Let's do a simple example of this then. Um, Right. So the example is as follows. Right. Now let's suppose I tell you f the frequency is equal to one hundred seconds minus one, which is one hundred hertz. Right. Okay. And I lose one half of energy. Okay. In ten seconds. All right. Okay. So. I'm going to find tau q and delta e over e over one period. Okay? Pretty straightforward, pretty simple, right? Let's go ahead and do it. Right. First thing, OK? 
Okay, I know e of t is going to be equal to e to the minus t over tau of the energy, right, of the initial energy that is. Okay, and I also know that e at t equals 10 seconds is equal to E0 over 2, right? That's half the initial energy. Okay, so lose one half the energy in 10 seconds, all right? Okay, so it's going to be equal to basically E0, E to the minus T over tau, or actually 10 over tau, okay? And so this is going to be equal to minus 10 over tau, is equal to e divided by e is one half, right? And so that means that minus 10 over tau is equal to the log, actual log of one half, which implies that tau is equal to 14.4 seconds, right? That's what we're straight for. So now I can compute q. q is omega zero times tau. That's just going to be equal to q pi times the frequency times tau, right? So it's basically 2 pi times frequency, 100, times tau, 14.4 seconds. So that turns out to be roughly about 9,000, right? Very high Q, right? Excellent oscillator. Great. Finally, let's go delta E over E over one period, right? We just figure that out. That's just basically this thing right here, minus 2 pi over q. q is 9,000. Plug everything in. This is going to be 7 times 10 to the minus 4, right? So it loses some tiny fraction every oscillation period. Okay. okay. That's, so that's pretty cool, right? So last but not least, all right, I'm going to basically look at um, driven oscillators. So, suppose I have some damp oscillator. Let's draw a picture of it. There's my spring, there's my mass, and then I'm going to put it in some water bath here. And so this thing, as it goes back and forth, I feel the damping force, Fd minus k times b, or uh, minus uh, b times z, right, sorry, All right? And now I'm going to attach it to a forcing function here, which is a function of time, which I'm going to say is going to be equal to f0 cosine gamma times t, All right? So let's work out all the forces here. So the net force is equal to, well, there's a spring here, minus kx, minus bv, okay? And now, but see, plus this f term here, plus f of t, which is minus kx, minus bv, um, plus f0 cosine gamma of t, okay? Now, this is f net, so it's basically m d squared x dt squared, that's ma, divided by m everywhere, Okay, now let's write it out. Okay, I'm going to bring all these things over to one side. d squared x, dt squared, plus now b over m dx dt plus k over m times x. This is, looks like the same as before. And now on this side, I have a little lower. I will let that equal to something that's not zero, f zero over m cosine gamma times t. All right, so. That is slightly something difficult to compute. How do we get around computing that? All right, well, let's make thing, a few things a little simpler. First of all, let's replace this thing with one over tau. Second, we'll replace this thing with omega zero squared. We know what those things are anyway, okay? And so now we have this horrible expression. Uh, let's write it one more time in a very clean piece of paper, e squared x dt squared plus 1 over tau dx dt 
plus omega 0 squared times x is equal to f0 over m cosine gamma of time t. Right? So first things first, I have this cosine gamma of t. I'm going to complexify it. Okay? And so what that means is that basically means I take cosine gamma t, I convert it e to the i gamma t. Right? The real part e to the i gamma t will give me cosine gamma t. Right? I know that, right? But using this form is, makes it way, way easier to solve it. So I'm going to set this equal to f over m e to the i gamma t. And so now I have to come up with a solution out of find x of t. So to find x of t, I'm going to guess, okay? And my guess is going to be very special now, all right? My guess is going to be something of the form. Because script A looks familiar, e to the i gamma t. Okay, so it's no longer sigma up here. I actually have a very specific form for what, for what, for what this function looks like. And what's going to turn out is going to be very useful. So let's go ahead and plug this in and see what happens. So first thing is that this thing, when I plug it in, all right, I get d by dt squared. So I'm going to get two factors of this one. So it'd be basically the i gamma squared, right? Script A, e to the i gamma t. Second term, we plus i gamma, I put one factor of i gamma there, divide by tau, script a, e to the i gamma t. Okay? Third term, plus omega 0 squared, script a, e to the i gamma t. We equal to f0 over m, e to the i gamma t. Right? So now, why the complexify thing work so nicely? Well, because now all of a sudden I can kill this thing off now. Look at that. But, unlike the example in the past, I cannot kill off this one, right? And so what I end up getting is script A times, let's see, so this is I, so that's be minus gamma squared plus omega zero squared, and now here's the imaginary part, plus I gamma over tau is equal to F zero over M, okay? So you solve this one algebraically. Script A is equal to F0 over M divided by omega 0 squared minus gamma squared plus I gamma over tau. Okay? This is right, but it's not very useful. The reason why is that I have this I in the bottom, and I don't want to deal with that if I don't have to. Okay? But this does mean that script A is complex. Okay, so let's basically try to untangle this one, right? Okay, uh, so in order to make this thing look like something familiar, I'm going to multiply it by a very special form of 1. So we will come with this, omega 0 squared minus gamma squared. Now this is a plus, so I'm going to choose minus i gamma over tau. Omega 0 squared minus gamma squared minus i gamma over tau. Okay, so that's just basically 1, because the numerator and I are the same. If I multiply against this, this will turn out to be something very special. Alright, so let's go ahead and do that. So, script A is now going to equal to, right, F0 over M, that same as before, okay? Uh, the numerator just gives me this, whatever this thing is, so let's write that thing down. Omega 0 squared minus gamma squared minus I gamma over tau. Okay. And then the denominator, it will be this term times this term, right? So because of that, you have the i, i will have a minus 1, and so that will kill off the minus 1 that will be there. So you get something that looks like this, omega 0 squared minus gamma squared, entire thing squared, okay, it's going to keep dividing this by, plus now gamma squared over tau squared. Okay, so that's script A. And it's written in terms of something that looks like a, um, a uh, complex number, right? So because of the complex number, you could write it as basically a e to the i delta, where now these are real constants, okay? And so we got to figure out what those real constants have to look like, okay? All right, so um, I'm going to state this without proof, right? a is going to be equal to f0 over m divided by the square root 
solve this entire thing here. Omega u squared minus gamma squared times x squared plus gamma squared over tau squared. And delta is going to be equal to the, uh, this is the sine cosine. So the arctan minus the tangent minus 1 of minus gamma over tau divided by omega zero squared minus gamma squared. Okay? Okay, so let's remind ourselves what this system is like. Okay, so what is gamma? Gamma is the frequency at which I'm driving it. So this is basically the driving frequency. So gamma is the driving frequency. Okay? And what's omega zero? Omega zero was the frequency of this thing if nothing else was there. So kind of like the natural frequency of it. All right? Okay? Okay? And so you can imagine I can always change what gamma is, right? It can basically make it faster, shake it slower. And so this thing will respond to that. So let's just plot this thing out. If I plot A as a function of gamma here, right? You can see that basically if I'm far away, A is of some certain value. But as I get closer and closer to omega zero squared, so that's omega zero. If I get closer and closer, this thing turns to be zero. I basically get something that blows up. It gets maximized right there. So draw the thing in like this. Okay. And now, how high does it go? Well, the height of this thing goes up to F0 over M divided by gamma over tau. All right? Okay. So that's the maximum there at that point. All right? And basically, it fades away right, as it goes further away from this thing. Right? So, um, one way of thinking about this is that you remind yourself Q is equal to omega 0 times tau, which the tau is equal to uh, Q over omega 0. Okay. Hold on, let me make it right. Sorry. Um, Q to the minus 1. Sure, I did that right. No, that's right. That was right. That was right the first time. Okay. Um, tau is equal to Q over omega zero, right? So now if you plug this part in here, this is one over Q that will flip it on top. This is going to be equal to Q F zero over M divided by gamma omega zero, right? Okay, and so basically what happens is that the height of this thing gets larger the larger Q is, right? right? And as a result, what happens is that this is the example, let's say for let's use the high Q. And then this low Q, it gets short, it gets more squat. So this might be low Q. And so this thing becomes something very special. This is what's called the resonant frequency. And it's the natural frequency of the system if it was nothing else was there. But it also turns out that at this frequency, you get the biggest amplitude, right? So this is basically, if you drive at resonant frequency, get the largest amplitude. Okay, so um, let's basically do a simple example of this, right? So the simple example is as follows here, okay? All right, so suppose I have 
um, a spring uh, with k equals, let's say, as a, a 10 newton per meter. The mass is equal to what about to five kilograms? Five kilograms. Okay. And then basically tau, the k rate is 100 seconds, right? I'm gonna find for F0 equals 1, find A, the resonant frequency, B, strip, I'm um, sorry, A max, okay, and C, basically A at gamma equals uh, 1 epsilon minus. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and do that. So first things first, all right? What's the resonant frequency? Well, in this case, it's basically this is just omega zero, and for this particular, it's just k over m, right? So for part a, omega zero is equal to square root of k over m, sorry, which is going to be equal to ten over five, which is square root of two. Right, which is about, I think, 1.41 um, radians per second. Right, that's the resonant frequency. Okay. Part B, let's compute basically A max. Right, so this is, uh, is when gamma equals omega zero. Right, let's write down what A is. So A is equal to F0 over M divided by square root of omega 0 squared minus gamma squared entire thing squared plus gamma squared over tau squared. Okay. So in this particular case, uh, this is just going to be 1 divided by 5. I know I'm driving at omega 0, so this term will be 0 there. So I'm just looking at the square root of, well, I should write this gamma square over tau square, and that will take, apply square root 1 over 5, and then basically put gamma over tau, and let's fill everything in now. So gamma now, I determined was basically square root 2, so 1 over 5, square root 2, because I'm drawing resonance, okay? And then this part right here, divided by tau, which is 100. Okay, all right. So, if I look at this thing, this can be equal to, let's see, it's 100 divided by 5 is 20, 20 over square root of 2. I think that's like, this is 14.1 meters. Okay, all right, now part C. Last but not least, let's not get that one as well. Let's compute basically A when this is the frequency. So this is right now. A is equal to F0 over M square root of omega 0 squared minus gamma squared entire thing squared plus gamma squared over tau squared. So it's going to be equal to this is 1 over 5 divided by square root of, okay, so this is going to be a little tricky, right? So omega 0 squared the square root of 2, so that's 2 minus, this one is going to be uh, 1, 1, entire thing squared, plus now, this is 1 squared divided by 100 squared, right, so that's some tiny number, and so, if I do that, this is 1 over 5, divided by, it's 2 minus, so it's, it's, um, it's 2 squared, because so square root of 2, right? 2 minus 1 is 1, so that's just 1 squared. This is just a tiny number, I don't care about it. So basically equal to square root of 1, it's basically equal to 0 0.2, right? So that's a big difference, right? So look at that, it goes from 14.1 meters all the way down to 0 0.2 meters, basically. By shifting the frequency, by basically just this tiny amount, right?
Okay. And that's it, basically.